welcome to Currency Cast. Is the quality and availability of data the biggest challenge for the group treasurer of a company that operates in 100 countries? And how does a large European energy group manage emerging market currencies? Welcome to Currency Cast. My name is Agustin McKinley. I'm the senior financial writer at Cantox and your host. In this episode, we have the pleasure to welcome Danilo Gonzalez, Treasury Manager at, for Europe and Africa at Siemens Energy. Danilo Gonzalez, a warm welcome to you and thank you for joining us in this episode of Currency Cast. Thank you for having me, Agustin. I'm pleased, pleased to meet you and uh, happy to discuss any FX topic with you. Right, that's great. Danilo, can you start by introducing yourself to our audience? Sure, of course. Uh, my name is Danilo Gonzalez. I am um, leading the what we call the Copetes Hub uh, for Treasury for the region Europe Africa. We focus on three main products, which is um, cash management, trade finance, and probably the most challenging FX management as well in different countries of the Europe Africa region. Right, we're going to go into the details of all that, but maybe first a, a, a general type of question. You work as, so for the Treasury Department of Siemens Energy and you're based in Lisbon, you have to oversee operations in Europe, in Africa, you work in a multicultural, multicultural environment and you're dealing with lots of internal and external stakeholders, right? Dealing, as you said, with, I mean, I imagine reports and controls, bank relations, exactly. risk management, maybe even uh, m and So how do you, how is the typical day of a, uh, um, the Treasury Department in these conditions? Yeah, that's that's correct. And um, and when you are doing this for for many years, you sometimes feel like uh, it's business as usual. But there is no single day that is equal to another. So the challenges are totally different from one day to another. Uh, let's say expect the unexpected sometimes, right? Um, so things are like this. Um, so basically. Um, we focus on the three products at the same time. It depends on wh what is your coverage. We have, um, for instance, um, people define or let's say allocated to the one country for the three products, or we can have uh, just um, persons dedicated for one specific product, like uh, FX managers only that covers FX manager management for three, four countries or we can have only one person dealing with the country with all the topics, treasury related topics. So it depends on the size, it depends on the volume, it depends on the complexity and the regulation of the country. So our idea is always to have, uh, let's say, a, a, an expert of the country that understands the country. And if there is a capacity, we can um, have grab more more countries or more geographies. It's, it's up to the capacity, to be honest. Right. Right now, Danilo, in a previous conversation, you told us that perhaps the biggest hurdle that the Treasury Department of a, a, a large group like yours has to face when managing Europe and Africa is the the quality and and the availability of of good data. Right, and especially in regards to all cash and liquidity management issues. So define a little bit or give us more details in that respect, maybe defining what, what is cash trapped and uh, cash cash trap and and how do you deal with that? Yeah, sure. Um, and it's it's right. So um, when, when you're in a big company, uh, of course, you need to deal with so many stakeholders. Um, in, if we give an example in the FX management environment, we have the what we call the commercial project managers um, who need to identify the risk, the currency risk, in which we can support with advisory, defining the right strategy, either for the contract, putting some currency clauses if, if required, trying to mitigate the risk. Then once it's materialized, we need to be properly informed that there is a hedge requirement. So basically communication is key. 
if nobody tells what they need, nobody will know. So you can even go to search for yourself, but it's going to be very complex because we are talking about going into different subsystems uh, or any other similar system where you might retrieve the information, but it's not it's not an easy take. Um, so communication is key that the exposure is correctly reported at once. Then uh, we have countries, big countries, where you might have 400 uh, commercial product managers that are dealing with currencies. Right. Uh, so it's, it's massive. So you need to have coordinators, you need to have people that uh, understand um, the concept and understand the risk uh, that this implies if they don't report. Then we move to the hedging, which is our task, uh, internally or externally to hedge. And then we have the third part, which is our fellows from accounting. They need to do the booking, they need to report the PNL, they need to um, do the what we call the outstanding transactions reporting, you know, the revaluation of the deals, or applying the uh, hedge accounting principles, embedded derivatives principles, etc. So we are like three teams collaborating each other on a regular basis. This is right. why it's important uh, that all are aligned and all speak the same language, to be honest. Right, absolutely. Look, um, I was talking to François Masquelier in Brussels, the CEO of Simply Treasury, and he was helping organize the EACT Summit, 2024 Summit in Brussels uh, recently. And and he's come up with a, what he calls a Treasury Tech Map. And half seriously, half jokingly, I suggested why not having a, a section on, on uh, the centralization of treasury operations because it seems to be quite a trend and you see it at the level of of cash management you see it at the level of foreign exchange risk management you see it at the level of data governance do you have a, a views on, on say the centralization maybe specifically in what regards the the availability of data or data lakes or a similar structure in place yes we we have an in-house bound solution no internally so which means that um the system owner is headquarters for e almost everything in treasury so it's a payment factory in, in cash management where we centralize everything internally because the disadvantage is that if you have many let's say solutions uh from from banks or service providers um you might end up with 10 tools so if you have your internal tool you have the capacity to develop it to enhance it and adapt it to your reality and your your problems let's put it this way your challenges same applies in in fx it's well centralized um it's a data lake basically uh and the, one of the big advantages is that you don't need to have so many, um, let's say, external users, let's put it this way, um, because then you lose control. And this is very, very important for us to have um, to understand what is going on in every country in terms of cash management, FX, who is doing what, and if it's doing under our guidelines. Um, otherwise, you lose control. And centralizing this, it means that we control the users, we control who is uh, sending deals to to externally or internally and of course it's a repository also of the fx confirmations no of the of the agents right? right so it's it's um the bookings is a different topic but it's it also makes life easier to be honest all right now let's uh, let's go a little bit more in detail into foreign exchange risk management maybe uh, you uh, you outlined the some of the ideas there but maybe um, we could go into a little bit more detail about, so for example, uh, who sets policy when it comes to foreign exchange risk management? Is it only headquarters or, and another interesting question is, are subsidiaries allowed to, to execute external trades where their own liquidity providers or just internal trades? Um, it, it will depend on the countries. So, but the rules are always, set by headquarters and then the applicability is a different story because when you are if you're in head, at headquarters you might have a vision saying like a, this is what i would like to implement what makes sense but knowing 
the applicability, if it's going to be 80%, 90% uh, worldwide, this is the challenge because you can set uh, 20 rules, but then maybe 15 are applicable and the other five not for Africa or for the Americas and so on. So you, we have to be a little bit flexible, but there is a main, let's say, main rule of what, what you can do, what you cannot do, and then you take it from there. So if there is an exception, needs to be approved internally, but it's it's rather seldom. Uh, we most try to follow the rules um, just because it's, it's um, let's say, it's a way to go. Um, we, we, we should not be deviating. And also because this give us a standardization. So right. when everybody does the same thing, uh, it's easier. Easier to extrapolate and it's easy to benchmark um or collaborate no? we can discuss with other colleagues saying also oh, how you how you guys do this we do it like this so because we use the same system so we can share knowledge and if they do totally different then it's it's not uh, it's not that easy to compare um mm -hmm. regarding if we do internally or externally at most extent we try to do it internally if the regulators say we cannot mm -hmm. then we go externally so it, it's a um, Tax issue is a tax uh, concept or legal concept that prevents us to to centralize. But right, really, yeah, okay, really interesting. Yeah, a tax issue, a regulation issue. That that was is what it, um, so creates the need for uh, some flexibility, right? And that's exactly I think what we have done here with our, our so-called Cantox in-house FX product, where we we clearly. So headquarters or head office is in charge of foreign exchange policy, but there is some a degree of flexibility, as as you mentioned, right? Maybe it's a tax issue, maybe it's a, a knowledge issue, maybe it's a, a regulation issue. So, for example, if Brazilians want to or, or have better conditions on their own, well, they could go external perhaps on their own, but always with uh, the policy set by headquarters. And I, I think that's that's uh, that matches what you you have described right danilo what about what's the so the type of exposure that that you you will face typically forecasted exposures is it in, so for rolling budgets or is it just individual campaign periods or perhaps even only transactional type of fx risk i guess it's going to depend on the on the situations as well right yeah but mostly let's say we make money with uh, product, uh, project business okay right. so um, selling turbines um, installation of a power plant it's a um, long tenor okay right. so or maintenance it's also long tenors 10 years 15 years right. and project businesses it's it's the probably the largest maybe the easiest to let's say to have a strategy uh because we don't you don't need to think too much about budget or forecast and so on so you just put the put the deals based on the milestones uh then, then you need to adjust uh but we also have product business no? for transformers for material and so on uh so there is um a forecast for this but it has a different strategy no? so we hedge for example product business a little bit different than when we hedge project business um and normally in product business, we do not apply hedge accounting. It's right. mostly in private business. And then you have maybe sales orders or purchase orders that you individually can hedge. Um, so it, it will depend also um, how how big is, is the amount because uh, uh, the internal rules, we say like uh, uh, until certain amount, we don't do anything or we don't do hedge accounting for uh, little little money. Let's Let's put right. it this way. Right. Okay. All right. Let's tackle, Danilo, if you will, the issue of emerging market currencies. I read yesterday a report by the Bank for International Settlements. It has good things to say about emerging market currencies, namely that more and more they are traded electronically through multi-dealer trading platforms and in regards to, to, um, to non-deliverable forwards also. There is a progress, more interna internationalization, more automated trading. What is your approach 
generally speaking, to exotic currencies and non-deliverable forwards? Yeah, uh, well, basically, um, for those exotic currencies, it's, let's say, country reality. Um, so, as I give you an example, in, in Nigeria, we decided that the functional currency should be dollar. So, we can uh, have inflows and outflows in dollar. So, we we are safer like this, because otherwise, the volatility will hit us strongly. There were elections in, in Nigeria um, recently, so it was... It was a, a lot. There was a lot of volatility, same as Angola. Um, so in some cases, we decide to pay earlier if we see that there is a devaluation in the currency, um, and if we have liabilities, we try to pay earlier. Um, so those kind of measures, we all, we are always try to be aware of what's going on. Um, banks, our banks help us a lot to keep us updated because uh, they they are very well connected to the central banks. Um, and then we try to always to, th there is a key element here that is that uh, your contracts need to be set very, very well. So you need to define, at least in Africa, define very well what is the onshore part, what is the offshore part uh, in a contract. So because the offshore part, normally the central bank will allow you to, to make transactions uh, in hard currency outside the country. Uh, then you pay taxes locally, you do your onshore part as local in local currency, but then the hard currency can flow outside, which is which is good news sometimes. Uh, it's not a warranty that, that the central bank will allow you, but it's uh, you you be you will be in a good position to achieve this if you have a really really well described contract in in this regard. And this mm -hmm. applies in most of the countries in Africa. Right. Yes. Absolutely. The importance of having uh, so. The uh, contracts as well, well prepared, and the and so uh, um, that you can enforce those contracts, right? Um, Daniel, in a previous conversation, we briefly discussed the South African rand, and you say you said it's a bit of a special currency now. Tell us a little bit what makes the South African rand such a special currency within this space. Yeah, I mean, South Africa is is like um, what, I, what I call the mini Europe in Africa. Okay, so you have everything there and uh, the FX market is not an exception. So you can hedge until 14 months, uh, as far as I know. Um, and of course, you can you can hedge um, any any hard currency that you can you can have um, without, uh, let's say, there is not a problem in hedging, but there is a lot of heavy documentation that need to be supported uh, and provided on a regular basis to the central bank. So there is no underlying transaction that the central bank is not going to look at or the auditors. Uh, so you have to be very prepared in terms of documentation, justify your transactions very carefully one by one. So this means that if I have a cash flow that I cannot justify, the central bank will force me to convert it back to rent. This is how it works, and this is why there is a good communication between cash management and FX uh, in order to have this in place in a proper way. And you can imagine that we do it externally there, and uh, the penalties could, could also go to the bank because the bank is my my transaction company or no, my, my intermediary. Um, so if the central bank will doesn't like what I'm doing, also my bank, my partner, might suffer some some penalties because of the strategies that we are doing. Right. right? So you need especially good uh, traceability capabilities, right? To make sure that every single item is traceable back to its uh, its original commercial transaction and and have yeah. it properly documented. Now, what is the impact, um, Danilo? Of I think you. It's uh, implicit there in what you said just before, but the the impact of interest rate differentials between currencies, the euro and some of those African currencies, as they are riskier and they are bound to have large interest rate differentials with the euro. At Cantos, what we do so, for example, in if Mexican companies are exporting to the US then will and in dollars they will have uh, favorable uh, forward points right they're, they're going to be to their advantage but and 
Okay, you need to anticipate as much as possible hedge execution. But what if those interest rate differentials are not going in your favor? So we favor solutions that delay the execution of, of hedging as much as possible. How do you approach that issue? Uh, in, in general basis for car, for hard currencies uh, in the binding offer phase, we anticipate a risk buffer. We can also use options to, to hedge the, until the contract is signed. But of course you have to pay a premium, so it's not very attractive. Right. Um, but yes, we put a risk buffer and then we make a calculation based on the milestone of, of the of the offer. So like this, uh, the hedge cost is kind of covered. Uh, you cannot anticipate the swaps, so the anticipations of participation of the of the cash flows. This is unexpected, but it's normally happen everywhere. But like this, you mitigate uh, your volatility. Uh, we uh, implement uh, um, head, um, hedge accounting to avoid the PNL impact, especially in long-term projects, more than five years. That uh, we want to avoid the, the PNL effects every year. Um, and yeah, so. Also, we do intercompany financing internally. So like this, if if possible and allow any country requires money, then, uh, then it headquarters is the is the primary uh, financer, uh, the, the primary entity that finance every single entity. So there is concept of cash concentration in cash pooling and similar similar applications. So then you can allocate the money where, where it's needed. So if I am large in 100 millions in the US, but I need it in, in, in other in other countries, in other continents, then it can be it can be easily used because it's a is it's well recognized. Let's let, no, let, let's say that. So if you know where your money is, it's easier to say I need this here and there. Right. Um, but for that, but we, do, we go back to the first part of the conversation, right? You're going to need to have those all the data available and and readily usable. Right? Yes. Yes. You need to know this. Uh, well, of course, we have we have all the, the CAM 53. We have the MT 940s to report in our central central payment factory system every information that we need. And, and even we have the same day for cash pooling accounts, we have the same day reporting. So the count uh, 50, 52 or MT942. Right. Now let's uh, change a little bit the, the subject. And Danilo, Siemens Energy is well known for its uh, at, um, the importance it gives to issues like uh, corporate social responsibility, ESG. We read that they, uh, the company wants to ensure our climate is protected and technology helps to protect the environment. So how do you at the Treasury Department uh, approach these, these issues? Um, well, actually, um, I mean, uh, we leave this, this ESG topic in every single department. So uh, Treasury is not an exception. Uh, uh, and so in the finance department, having a bigger no, putting treasury inside the finance department. Of, there are a lot of initiatives in terms of diversity, uh, to have, um, let's say, equality, gender equality, and so on. So, as well as um, in terms of environment, um, to be re the sustainability, we have um, auditors or let's say rating office um, offices that help us to let's say to rate our numbers in terms of sustainability internally right so we get some numbers we have help from from externals to have this in in a proper let's say uh, in, in a well control um but it's not an isolated effort so if the company leaves this is part of our values is part of our behavior so we in finance we also uh, replicate what the other departments do so it's transversal to to all the all the team members yeah all right so no not a specific issue for treasury but a company-wide type of of policies all right danilo thanks very much now let's uh, get maybe towards the end of this conversation with a, a broad question about 
about Africa in general. I hear, or I, I read rather, on Bloomberg, uh, let's say a rather not so optimistic article about um, Nestle, Unilever, and Bayer. Uh, so uh, abandoning some of the manufacturing capabilities in the continent. And especially what I found striking is that they all cite the issue of the currency instability. So overall, and taking a long-term view, long -term view what is your view of the continent, African currencies? What can be expected? Um, I, I, I will understand that, for example, banks uh, taking out the foot or, out of Africa um, or depends on what you do. But for us, energy it needs to be implemented everywhere. And Africa is the right place to be. To be uh, this is our, our view. And uh, just on the top of my head, I know that we are having new contracts almost every day here and there. So there is no way that we will we will say let's move out of Africa when there is a really really big market to to cover. Um, how we solve our risk when we go into those markets? It's a it's a very good question because um, I mean Treasury is normally involved in in early stages to define the risk uh, to define okay it's not only important to win the contract but also how we are going to get the money out um and like this uh, you need to be really careful on on the regulation and this regulation in every country changes a lot can be in one year two three times right. and this is the challenge but always when a door is closed there is a window that, that opens uh, i can give you an example that for instance in one country one bank say A, no, you cannot. And the bank B says, yes, you can. And so sometimes laws have a kind of different interpretation. So you need to assess, maybe you have more than one partner, you need to go to partner one and partner B and and, and let's say challenge. Uh, are you sure? Because otherwise I will go with B and uh, B thinks different. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will, I mean, you, you need to have options. Um, and this is what we do, but you need to be updated. You need to be on top of the information. You need to know that, for instance, if in Nigeria there is a devaluation, it might not last maybe six months, maybe after the elections, things get better, things like that. So we also talk to the banks and say, like, what's your expectation? It's going to be better. When? Because we have a lot of pipeline here. We don't get the money out, uh, so we don't pay. So what is going to happen in six months? And they give you estimation, so you okay. Then uh, you manage your expectations as well, right? Um, also, an important maybe maybe you don't know this, but um, in several countries in Africa, if you go there, you cannot go alone. So normally you need to go with a local company, and then you do a joint venture in which you might have 51, 55 percent of ownership. So you are the owner or the primary owner, but you can never go alone. So in some countries, you need a local presence from. Uh, local people uh, or a join another company that belongs to the to the corporation that you are building. So at a certain point, they share your risk because if the depreciation is hitting you, it's hitting them as well. Mm. Uh, and if you want to repatriate money, they need to get their part as well. Or if you need to pay dividends, they need to get their parts as well. So, uh, but this is how, how it is. So the, the local markets might need to protect their own people and their own companies. So they say, you are a foreign company, you want to come here as a non-resident, you need to partner with somebody locally um, in a minority, but still. So this is very common also in Africa. Um, and another probably very, very important topic is central bank. It behaves very similar in different countries. So you can extrapolate what the central bank wants. Well, that's useful, right? Uh, very yeah, useful. It's very useful to to have knowledge in, in, in different countries. You can compare realities and then at the end you say, okay, let's have the same process or we, we know what we expect from the central banks. Mm -hmm. So we can anticipate problems. All right. Look, I like the sense of reasonable optimism that you are displaying here. So um, it, it goes right in what um, the way we approach also emerging market currencies and the emerging market world prudently but with reasonable optimism 
Now, uh, uh, Danilo Gonzalez, Treasury Manager for Europe and Africa at Siemens Energy. Thanks a lot for um, so being here today. We've covered a lot of ground. We started out by discussing Treasury operations in a very general way. We discussed a little bit the problem of data availability. We went on then to to talk about emerging market currencies and and you've outlined the the all of those scenarios. Is there anything, Danilo, that you would like to add? Uh, no, uh, rather thank you, thank you for having me in in the show. It was a real pleasure, and hopefully, uh, talk to you soon. All right. So again, Danilo Gonzalez, um, Treasury Manager for Europe and Africa at Siemens Energy. Thanks a lot for being here in CurrencyCast, and see you next time. Thank you. Bye.